Hello, YouTubers and fellow hams. Well, I uh, recently did a little project here uh, for remote control of my station and uh, asked about it on Facebook if anybody wanted me to do a video and the response was 100% and overwhelmingly positive. So here we are. Now, as you know from the title, this is going to be about this little guy, the Raspberry Pi. This is a tiny computer. It is based on the ARM processor, same processor in your cell phones and tablets and many, many, many small devices. We're going to set this up as a headless computer. Now, headless means it will not have a monitor or keyboard or mouse connected to it directly. You'll connect to it across the network, uh, across your in-home network. It's possible also to connect to it across the internet, although I wouldn't want to open up a remote desktop type functionality across the internet. You'd become an instant target for the uh, hackers out there in China and, and Brazil, which are always scanning my networks and most all of your networks as well, looking for open ports. Uh, but within your own internal network, uh, this will allow you to control your radios from your laptop in the comfort of your recliner or as I do sometimes with my Chromebook sitting out on my porch watching the nice weather and the birds fly around while I'm operating some PSK 31. Uh, the Raspberry Pi, uh, one of the most popular operating systems for it is called Raspbian and that is the Debian Linux operating system cross-compiled for this architecture. Now Raspbian contains all pretty much all of the same software that's available under Debian or Ubuntu or any of the other flavors of Linux based on Debian which is you know tens of thousands of programs including many many amateur radio programs programs like FL rig WSJTX and so on uh, so you can do quite a bit with this little device the same kind of stuff that you do with a desktop computer sitting at your uh, at your ham, ham location uh, aside from the convenience of being able to operate your radios from another computer in your house, uh, there's some other advantages to go on this route. Maybe you don't have the space on your ham desk for a computer. Um, maybe it's a uh, boot up speed. This little guy will boot up and be ready to operate in 10 to 15 seconds. So from the moment I plug the power into it, uh, 10 seconds later I can connect to it and start playing radio so it's very fast uh, the, the netbook that I normally have hooked up to my computers takes longer to boot then I've got to log in then I've got to do a bunch of other things to, see, you know, to get it going whereas this I can just plug it in grab my Chromebook go out and sit on the porch and by the time I'm there and open up the Chromebook this is ready to go so it's very convenient for me anyway um, so anyway uh, the Raspbian image uh, I'm not going to go through setting up Raspbian and getting this thing booting. There's thousands of videos out there on getting the Raspberry Pi going. Uh, we're just going to talk about some basics here. So the first thing you're going to want to do after you've got the Raspbian image on the little micro SD card in here and the first time that you power this up, you're going to need to have it hooked to a monitor and keyboard and mouse to initially configure it before you can connect to it remotely. Uh, the one of the first things you're going to want to do is uh, you're going to want to um, set the IP information, the networking information for it. You'll connect it to your wireless network or plug it in through Ethernet. It has a built-in Ethernet port. Uh, and then uh, you'll connect it to your wireless network. Now up in the upper right corner of the Raspbian desktop is a network manager and it should automatically scan for your wireless network when it first boots up. It might take it a little while, but it'll find it. And when you connect to it, you might have to enter your passcode. I mean, that's all pretty standard. But what we want to do is we want to be able to get to this guy over the network. And to do that, we need to know what its IP address is. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Uh, it will have a host name that you can access, um, local dot, I forget what the name is, I'll look it up and put it up on the screen. Um, you can get to it that way. It should work okay. But what I like to do is I like to assign the devices on my network a static IP address. 
Now networking. The, uh, the TCP IP address, the, the group of numbers that are assigned to your devices, is unique to every device on your network. It's kind of like the number on your house. You know, the mailman has to know which house to deliver the letters to. Likewise, devices on your network have to have an address so that network packets know which machine um, they're, they're intended for. The network router, which is built into your cable modem or your internet terminal, uh, runs a, a protocol called DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol. DHCP is responsible for handing out addresses to new devices on your network. When you connect a new device and power it up, the first thing it does is throws out a query. Is there a DHCP server here? If so, give me an address. And the DHCP server will respond with, hello, here I am, and here is your address. You can tell the DHCP server to give a certain device a static address, static meaning it never changes, or on the devices themselves you can assign a static address and they won't query the DHCP server, they'll just come up and boot up with that address every time. That's the method I like to use and I keep a list of the devices on my network and what their addresses are. My printer is at 192.168.1.250. You know, my, my tower computer is at a certain address. My netbook is at a certain address. The little computer I have hooked to my television set is at a certain address. I, I manage those myself. Now, how you decide to do it is up to you. And there's many tutorial videos out there on networking and how you can assign addresses. On the Raspberry Pi, while you've got it hooked up to your monitor and keyboard, if you're going to assign it an address, uh, you go back up here to the wireless manager and if you right click on it you see an option there at the top to manage the networking information and we'll go to the uh, WLAN 0 which is the wireless network in my case and here we can enter our manual information now the addresses on your network are probably going to start with 192.168.1 dot and then that fourth number is going to be the unique number to each device on your network the range is uh, 1 through 254. Usually 1 is reserved for your router um, and then the router's DHCP range will vary but it's usually quite broad. However, upper addresses are generally safe. Uh, there's almost never anything assigned an address above 250. So up around there is where I usually assign my addresses. Now in the case of my Raspberry Pi, I'm going to give it the address 253. The DNS server, which is the name server, and the router, uh, the router is always going to be address 1, and the DNS server, you're going to want to give it the router's address, and the router will then pass name server requests through. DNS is um, domain name service, is a database of names and their associated addresses. So the internet really only understands numerical addresses. When I say go to www.google.com, the internet doesn't know what that means. But a DNS server will look up google.com and return an IP address, whatever it happens to be, 8.8. .8 .something or other, or whatever it is. Um, so then your computer will ask for that address instead of the name. Anyway, um, you'll need to know what the first three numbers are on your network, and you can find that out from any device that's already connected to your network. They won't change. So I'm going to assign my Raspberry Pi a static address so I always know where it's at. Now the next thing we need to do is we need to enable the VNC service. VNC, Virtual Network Computing, is a remote desktop sharing protocol. It's a way of connecting to a computer with another computer and making that other computer a remote monitor, keyboard, and mouse on the one you're connecting to. So it allows you to use that remote computer as if you're sitting right in front of it, extending the mouse, the keyboard, and the monitor to your remote machine. So we're going to enable that. Now you go to the Raspberry Pi menu and down near the bottom we have our settings configure uh, for Raspberry Pi and there's a services tab and here we find 
uh, the VNC service. It's already installed. All I have to do is tick it to enable it. Uh, additionally, there will be some configuration I have to do on the VNC service. After I've rebooted the Pi, I can come up in here and I can set all kinds of options for it. Uh, what we want to do is we want to set a password in the security options so that uh, not just anybody can connect to your, uh, your Raspberry Pi across your network. Or maybe you don't want a password. It's up to you. That's all personal preference. I set a password so that uh, if somebody is crack, ever cracks my Wi-Fi or is sitting here on my network, they won't be able to access it without knowing the password, but that's just personal preference. Um, that's the only thing we really have to set there in the, uh, in the VNC settings. Okay, our Pi is now configured to the point where we can connect to it across the network, and uh, we're ready to take it up and hook it up. You want to shut down the Pi using the menu. You never want to just pull the power. Important, let me repeat that. You never want to just pull the power on a Raspberry Pi. That's like pulling a power plug on your desktop computer and that can corrupt the file system um, and mess up you know, the disk image. You'll have to re-image the whole thing and start over. So always use the menu to shut down your Raspberry Pi. Okay, so now I've got my Raspberry Pi up here at the computer desk, or at the radio desk, and I'm gonna hook it up to my radio. I've got my Duino Vox, and you might have a signal link or some other rig interface. We'll, hook, we'll plug in that USB, and then I've got a Keyspan serial adapter uh, for rig control, and I'm going to plug that in. And we're ready to go. I'll power up the Pi, and then we can come back over to my desktop computer, and we can connect to it. All right, so I've got the Raspberry Pi powered up and ready to go. And here on my desktop computer, which is also running Linux, I need to install a VNC viewer, Victor Nancy, Victor Nancy Charlie, or Virtual Network Computing. If I come up here in Synaptic and I search for VNC viewer, we'll find a few options here. There's uh, what you use is up to you. I like the GVNC viewer. For Linux, it's command line driven, but you can create a shortcut in your menus or desktop. Uh, there's other options here. Um, X Type VNC Viewer is popular as well. So you'll go into Synaptic and you'll install whichever one you want to use, apply, and it will install the VNC Viewer. Now, as I said, the GVNC Viewer is a command line driven um, program. So I'm going to control alt t to open up a terminal. And if I just type gvnc viewer, you can see it gives us uh, some some hints there. Usage gvnc viewer host name colon display. Well, we really only need the IP address. So, I used 192.168.1.253 and I defined a password so it's coming up and it's asking me for my password and here we go this is our Raspberry Pi get those out of the way so it's not confusing here and we'll uh, we'll zoom that up a little bit for you now by default the Raspberry Pi desktop is going to come up at 640 by 400 resolution, which is very, very small. So we'll go in here, and the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go down here to Preferences, Raspberry Pi Configuration. And we are going to set, let me get that out of the way, Set Resolution, this button here. And this uh, little window gives us our options. And you can choose the desktop resolution that you want the Pi to run at. Uh, I use it on my Chromebook, so I generally set it to 1280 by 720. Um, the other thing is uh, overscan. That really has to do with, if you're operating on a, on a television, that overscans out to the borders, and it's enabled by default. We want to disable that so that we just have the resolution that we set. Now, when I hit OK, it's going to say, oh, you've got to reboot now to, to have the new changes take effect. So I'll say yes. And now here's where we'll see the uh, speed of the reboot. It's rebooting right now. It's going to be ready to go in about 10 seconds. Um, while I'm waiting on that, I'll talk about how you can launch it. Now, I use the terminal to launch GVNC Viewer, uh, but that's a little inconvenient. So I have edited the menu 
on my desktop here, I'm running Ubuntu Mate. I like the Mate desktop. It has this taskbar across the top, classic menus like the old Windows XP days. Um, and I have already added a menu entry to VNC to Raspberry. And uh, if you're running Ubuntu Mate, you just right click on the menu and hit Edit Menus. And then you can go in um, to the menu you want to choose, create a new item. And in the case of the VNC to Raspberry, as you can see here, all I had to do was enter the command that I'm going to use, GVNC Viewer and the address, and close, and that saves this, um, this menu entry. You can also change the icon here if you want. I haven't changed it yet. So all I need to do is go to this menu, VNC to Raspberry, boom, there it's asking for my password. And now, as you can see, our Raspberry Pi has come up at a higher resolution. 1280 by 720 was what I set it to. And we're ready to start setting it up for rig control. <clears throat> One of the first things that I do on a, on a Linux machine is I will install Synaptic Package Manager. And you'll do that by opening a terminal here and type sudo apt-get install synaptic. Now I've already done it so it's just going to tell me that it's already the current version. Uh, but what it should do is it'll uh, ask you for your password and it will install the program and then you're ready to run it. So uh, from the terminal I'll do sudo synaptic. SUDO means run this program as the root or the god user on the machine. And that'll bring up the Synaptic Package Manager. Here we go. And this is what you will use to install software on your Raspberry Pi just like you would on any other Linux desktop. And as I said, the entire Debian software library is available. Thousands and thousands of programs, including our favorite ham radio programs. If I hit search and I put in FL Digi, It'll do a search and it'll come back with... It takes it a moment. There we go. <clears throat> and as you can see, we've got FL Digi, FL Rig, and the various other files that support it. So you can simply click on the box and mark for installation, which I've already done on this machine. Uh, FL Digi, FL Rig for Rig Control, WSJTX, although WSJTX that's on uh, the, the Raspbian repositories is an older version. This little blue globe up here is the web, brow web browser and it's Chromium. It's going to take it a moment to launch because I've never launched it. So on the Raspberry Pi I'll go to the WSJTX Princeton physics site and I'll scroll down <coughs> and I'll pick this <coughs> I'll pick this version for Raspi and Jesse and click on it to download it. And it will store it in your downloads directory. Keep. And there it is. And if I right click on it, uh, I'll see package install. And that's all I need to do to install WSJTX. Most of the rest of the software, though, I'm going to install through Synaptic. So I'm going to install FL Digi, FL Rig. Uh, I'm also going to install Xlog because that's the logger that I use. Uh, so you can, you know, you can install the software that you want to use for your rig control. Um, a note on the keyspan: um, if you have the keyspan serial adapter, uh, its firmware is not automatically available. But if we search Google for Keyspan uh, Linux firmware. There is a little site that I stumbled across. Uh, here we go. I think this is it. Chris Danielson's blog. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chris, for putting this together. <clears throat> he provides this file here, keyspan.zip which has the firmware files for the Keyspan serial uh, adapter. So if you have one of those serial adapters like I have, you'll need to go to, to uh, Chris Daniels' blog site 
and he tells you what to do in here. Um, unzip the file and copy them into slash lib slash firmware on your Raspberry Pi. And once you do that and plug the uh, serial adapter back in, it'll just work. So you might have to do that if you have a Keyspan serial adapter. Other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Once we've installed FL Rig, FL Digi, we just come up here to the Raspberry Pi menu. There'll be a ham radio uh, menu. And I can come down here and, like, let's run uh, FL Rig, which is for radio con or rig control. And that is talking, I've already configured it, it's talking to my FT817. And the frequency is correct. It's presently on 14.070.15. On so that's working. Um, FL Digi. And there is FL Digi. And oh, look at that. There's a PSK signal. How about that? Now, um, configuring the software. Okay. Let's go to uh, configure an FL Digi and let's go to sound card. FL Digi automatically sees the sound card that's in my rig interface. I've got a Telex USB sound card built into my Duino box and it shows up there. Default would use the audio chip on the Raspberry Pi. So you're going to want to, when you configure your FL Digi, you're going to want to go in and select whatever sound card your signal link or interface presents for you. Uh, rig control, uh, when we configure that, set up transceiver. Okay, serial port. Uh, when I plug in my key span, it creates this serial port. Under slash dev, we find slash TTY USB 0, and the USB is in caps. That is by far the most common serial device name for serial adapters and probably what you'll use. Uh, you don't have to do anything squirrely with um, dial-out group access or any of, this, of the security settings like you do on the desktop Linux. It's a lot easier under Raspbian. You only have to know what serial device name your serial port adapter is using. And you can usually find that out if we go to the file browser here, file manager, and we go up to the root of the file system and look in dev, which stands for devices, uh, these are virtual files. They represent every piece of hardware on the system. And if we scroll down to, to TTY, which is the serial ports, with your serial adapter plugged in, you should see a TTY USB 0 okay or USB 1 it depends on how many serial devices you have hooked up so look for that to find the device name and pay attention to case that's important so TTY is lowercase USB is capitals and then that's a zero because it's the, the first device so that's how you'll find the serial device for rig control so once you've got everything configured and operating you're good to go if you in install a VNC viewer on any computer on your network you can easily remotely connect to this Raspberry Pi that's hooked up to your radios and you can operate digital modes remotely um, from your laptop, from a desktop in another room. Yes, it might be possible to do it across the internet if you wanted to open up port 5900 through your router, but I would not recommend that. You'll become a target. Uh, you'll become a target for hackers because port scanners are constantly scanning ranges of home internet providers and they're looking for specific ports like file sharing ports, um, SSH, uh, VNC, things like that. So it would be like holding up a big red target to the internet and saying, come at me. You, know? <laughs> uh, you might be able to do it through a VPN. There's, there's, there's ways to get around that if you're more advanced with IT. You could technically control your radios from across the internet. Um, how you do that is up to you. It's your responsibility um, how your your radios are configured and set up and how reliable that is. You know, if you're going to accidentally lock a radio in a transmit, that would be a bad thing if you happen to be states away visiting the grandparents, you know. So it's, it's completely up to you what you do. I use it for uh, sitting out on the porch enjoying the weather and still doing some digital stuff. Or when my back is really flaring up and I need to lay down, I'll lay down in the recliner 
and use the computer I've got hooked to the TV to connect to the radio and work a little uh, work a little PSK. Um, I had a question on the Facebook page, so let me quit out of FL Digi here. Um, somebody was asking about WSJTX and they wanted to know if the Raspberry Pi was fast enough to decode a busy FT8 band segment. <coughs> um, yes, it is if you change the decode method. So I'm launching WSJTX here and uh, we're going to, I've already configured it, but we're going to go to mode FT8 for 20 meters and uh, yep, it changed the frequency. Rig control is working. And uh, I don't know if it's busy yet. Let's see. Yeah, it's a little busy. And we'll see it do a decode here. Okay, that wasn't bad. It, it took a, it took about a second to to decode those uh, six stations. But if we go up here to this menu, decode, and we set that to fast. And now let's see how fast it decodes. Boom! Look at that. Holy cow! That was quick. That was a fraction. That was a quarter of a second for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine stations. It decoded in a quarter of a second. Um, fast decode is not going to get the weakest signals out of the noise, but it's definitely fast enough to give you time to click on one of the CQs if you want to respond to it. You can watch here; it's going to do it again. Now let me just erase that so you can see that. It, see how fast it is when it's got a blank slate. Here we go. Boom! Look at that. So. So yeah, if you set that decode mode to fast, um, it's plenty fast for decoding a lot of stations on a busy band segment and giving you the chance to get in there and click if you like to do FT8. But anyway, yeah, it's fast enough. Um, the, the current Raspberry Pis are plenty fast and uh, it, it works just fine. And you can see it's, it's decoding those very quickly. So, you know, that's the, that's the gist of it. You can use the Raspberry Pi as a quick and convenient way to remotely access your radio from any computer in your house. Uh, I like to use it for when I'm down at the bench. I'll uh, put, pull it up on the bench computer and just watch the band that I'm, that I'm on. Um, and with rig control on my automatic antenna tuner, I can change frequencies and uh, check the other bands out too. So, it's handy. All right, so there you go. Um, I hope you found that useful. Uh, and uh, enjoy. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.